Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. I'm, as it's been said, I'm a microbiologist. I really like viruses. In fact, I'm fascinated by viruses because something so small can take over an entire organism and change completely, not just the physique, but often the behavior. When I was in my PhD and studying, I was so excited that I was able to characterize a newly discovered virus, fantastic. And then I thought, oh, maybe I'll just name it after myself. Um, except, no, you're not allowed to do that. And then you do the second virus, the third, the fourth, you keep discovering things. And you realize that it's not the virus that you're discovering. The virus is there wherever you're looting. It's you find ways of looting that you're actually discovering. And if we look back over the last 20 years, we can see a number of outbreaks from infectious diseases. So these are just viruses. And we can see that they're fairly regular. We have the first coronavirus SARS, then we had um, the bird flu, the swine flu, different flavors of flu, MERS coronavirus. Now we have the newest one with cases in the tens of millions, hundreds of millions, deaths, maybe in the tens of millions, still ongoing. And it is a set of questions that we are asking all the time. So the information that we request is exactly the same. It doesn't matter which virus is coming. We want to know what is the cause? Where did it come from? So to prevent it from coming again in the future. Is it changing? If it does, how quickly? How many people are infected? Why? Maybe because they wear masks or maybe because they don't wear masks. Um, are there differences in the patient presentation? So some of them have symptoms, some not. What can we do now? But more importantly, what can we predict about the future? And really what we've seen is that the real impact to be able to answer these questions comes from data sharing. It is the rapid data sharing that can maximize the utility of our data. Imagine it as a giant puzzle where the pieces are constructed in different parts of the world. And then they're just coming together to provide us with the answer. For example, in this current pandemic, the early sequencing, so sharing the genetic information of SARS-CoV-2, the virus causing COVID-19, was provided by colleagues in China. It was picked up immediately by colleagues in Europe, Germany, in the UK, the US, who produced the vaccines. It was picked up by even more colleagues across the world who produced hundreds of diagnostics. And the fact that we were able to provide and manufacture reliable diagnostics faster than ever before is really down to the fact that the information was shared very, very quickly. But we've done this because we were under duress. <laughs> there was an emergency. What happens if there is no emergency? And this is really where we need to reach some sort of international consensus because the emergency never goes away. We just go into a deep, maybe relaxing for a few years and then another one comes later. So we need to find ways where the information is shared in a timely manner to answer complex healthcare questions. But it's not that we share our information only, we share our vulnerabilities at the same time. We share our common interests and successes. So in order to do this effectively, we need some mechanism, we need some governance to maintain the trust, to build the trust and allow us to continue to share. And it's this openness that really can confront misinformation. And we've experienced misinformation with tragic consequences during the current pandemic. But 
as we haven't all been created equal, not all countries are equal when it comes to sharing data. The infrastructure, there is an infrastructure required and the infrastructure required is not equally distributed across the world. So we need to pursue this digital maturity for healthcare where we can access the important missing pieces of the puzzle wherever they are in the world. And we need not to forget the urgency. We need to act now because it takes a number of years to decrease this technological inequity and to embrace the digital inclusion. In other words, work now so that the healthcare benefits reach us all. So let's, let's find an example. Because what we've been talking about, it's all about the population and sometimes the population can be very abstract. If we're talking about ourselves, so this is me when I was thinner, and we talk about external exposures, so this might be atmospheric pollution, some chemical we breathe, even the food we eat, and the genetic information that we have, because we're all slightly different. And then we try to understand how our internal response relates to those two other elements. Then we have the ability to close the circle and create accurate and personalized healthcare provision. And this is not a fantasy. At the moment, the European Union is spending upwards of 120 million euros in 10 projects specifically relating to the exposure. And we're already discussing for a second generation of work that can bring all these pieces of the puzzle together. So that's good. We should be very happy, actually. Technologically, we're able to proceed. But then there is a bit of a question. Should we do so? Because we're able to do it, does it mean we have to do it or even consider doing it? For example, would you be comfortable if by sharing your data, you were notified that in six months you'll develop disease X? Or would you be comfortable that you share your data in order to crowdsource some algorithm that will predict something about your condition? So it's not just about the technology. Technology is great, but actually it has to come together with a lot of work to relate to the social acceptance. And this is just a schema for how we try to approach this problem. Because it's not just to create the latest computer that can do fantastic things. But how does this relate to the cultural norms where we apply the algorithm? Because what happens here today is not exactly perceived in the same way as when it happens in Vietnam or in Indonesia or in South America. So we have to relate the technology to the cultural norms. And then we have to understand the professional acceptance of it because every time we introduce, there is this perception of change. So how does this relate to our everyday lives? And then where does the political incentive, where does the financial incentive come in so that we're able to actually fully adopt the sharing of data shaping our digital health. So this has to be built on a foundation of transparency. If we're ever able to use and share data so that we develop our healthcare abilities, it has to be through a trust mechanism. And that has to be based in transparent handling. In 2020, I took part in the G20 Digital Health Summit that was in Riyadh. And it was probably one of the, of the first times where the digital healthcare agenda was right at the top of the action points. And a picture started to emerge, not just about information sharing, but about the need to understand what it all means. We can share data, but we still need to somehow integrate it, somehow translate it, so that we know what to do with it. 
it's fine to have a thousand pictures of um, skin conditions but we need to still be able to filter them so that the machine, the algorithms understand what they're looking for. The pandemic has allowed us to test a lot of these and has allowed us to test more services taking place remotely. So after surgery, for example, follow on can be done from the house with a remote presence. More often, and thankfully more inclusive. But more data means we have to account for complexity. And with the complexity comes responsibility. So there has to be an aspect of governance and security. So it's absolutely fantastic. As a virologist, we couldn't be happier. We have all the tools of the trade to be able to understand viruses better than ever before quicker than ever before, new technologies, but also they will come with new skills and perhaps in the future with new professions. Thank you very much. <laughs>